Got it. And uh, so Rudolf Steiner in his economics lectures spoke about a global economy. He was well aware that we are entering a global era where culture and civilization will be developing for the whole of humanity, is developing. And of course, that's already been going for some centuries as the Europeans set out from their enormous, um, enormous territories like uh, Portugal or the Netherlands, or I'm being ironic, uh, England, and uh, took cultural control of huge areas you know, Portugal, big chunks of Africa and some places in India and China, Netherlands, the whole of Indonesia, uh, the New York City area for a while. But we're entering a stage where humanity will have a global culture and it needs to be a better culture than we've had so far. And we're doing it while we're, as Steiner says, we're in the stage of developing strong individuality. For some reason, it's a little bit paradoxical, we need to be really strong individuals in order to become really valuable parts of a future society. Now, Rudolf Steiner's work with the threefolding of society, which many of you have heard about right after World War I, when the Empire of Germany and the Empire of Austria-Hungary, both and the Empire of Russia, all lost their monarchs and had to figure out new systems of government. He suggested that there were three different aspects of a society, and each needed its own rules, and that if you organize society along those lines, everybody could participate in every aspect of society and they would be managed appropriately. People would have the freedom to develop themselves in culture, education and values and beliefs. People would respect each other in the life of rights and agreements, the political and security realm. And people would uh, look out for each other in the economic life. They'd realize that, you know, if we take care of each other, we can uh, see that everybody has an adequate starting place. This is a picture of a, of a healthy organism, and the point again is that an individual could be part of all of it in different ways. But we have to become strong individuals in order to do that. We mentioned this morning Abraham Maslow, who's well-known in a lot of circles. He's known for the uh, hierarchy of needs. It's been represented as a pyramid. He didn't himself do that, but basic physical needs that if you don't have them met, they hinder you having a full uh, human life. Then sort of interpersonal needs where you want respect, you want to accomplish things, you want to fulfill yourself. It's an interesting difference, corresponds a little bit <clears throat> in anthroposophy to the, you know, etheric and physical side of life, and then the astral and ego side of life, and he called it self-actualization. And as a psychologist, he came to explore this when he realized that he and his colleagues were all looking at psychological deficiencies, illnesses, and we're not looking at psychological strengths. So the idea that the ego is something that's developing, that isn't mature yet, and the personality we create isn't even our true ego, but it's a worldly manifestation of it, we're trying to be better and better people. We're trying to be kind. We're trying to be thoughtful. We're trying to be creative and resourceful. You can make your picture of what an ideal human being might be like and see 
parts of it in yourself and parts of it all around you. We're in progress. Humans are evolving and not just in the ways that uh, that Charles Darwin brought for us, which uh, kind of an obsession with a lot of people these days. It's all evolution. It's all survival. No, human evolution goes way beyond survival. And uh, Abraham Maslow at the end of his life said, well, actually, it's not just self-realization, it's self-transcendence. We have the expression, get over yourself, uh, when somebody's not being resourceful. Um, when we get to that point where it isn't, or as you know, Martin Luther King was mentioned this morning, uh, it's not about me anymore. I've been to the mountaintop. I've seen the other side. He did the work he particularly needed to do. And he realized that he might not live much longer. And he said, you know, that's okay. This is what I'm here for. Didn't talk about reincarnation, but we can look forward to who that individuality will be next time. Creating a global culture has been approached from the West, from the capitalist um, free trade empire um, dominated by the Anglo-American world, but now pretty much enculturated into most of the rest of the world, including China and India, the most populous countries. Um, We've got a cultural idea that was brought forward after the fall of the Berlin Wall called the Clash of Civilizations. It's the idea that the Christianity of Central and Western Europe and the Americas were a civilization and they end up being in conflict with the other civilizations of the world, that Eastern Europe, Russia, Ukraine was a different Orthodox Christianity. It was a different civilization. We couldn't work with them. We'd be in conflict. We'd be in conflict with Islam. We'd be in conflict with the Hindu world. We'd be in conflict with the Buddhist and Confucian worlds. And uh, there was a map of this in The Economist in 1990. And there was a book called The Clash of Civilizations, which people should, if you have time, be aware of. In the introduction, it talks about needing to know who we hate in order to know who we are. That's a very twisted sense of selfhood. So there are competing cultures out there. Uh, socialism is a cultural impulse. Capitalism, of course, free trade, uh, anarchism, um, libertarianism, uh, the communism we associate with Russia, the original communism was from uh, French Christians. I studied one, Etienne Cabet. We all try to be like Jesus. We work in one factory, we sleep on wooden benches, and uh, that was le vrai chrétienisme, and that was what he called communism. Dostoevsky studied this as a young man. So we've got all of these things, but Rudolf Snyder was trying to bring something which would connect our modern scientific culture and its accomplishments with a renewed capacity to experience higher consciousness. And if we understand anthroposophy in that way, we see something which can't be carried out by any of the daughter movements. It's not a task for Waldorf education. It's not a task for biodynamic agriculture or for anthroposophic medicine or for the Camp Hill movement, although that uh, is a very, very rich culture. It's something which we need to try to grasp and which last night I suggested Rudolf Steiner had wanted to bring and didn't find anyone who could really comprehend its scope among the people who worked with him in the first 25 years of 
the 20th century. Andrei Biele, the great Russian writer, gave us the, who, who lived with Asya Turgenev across the street from the Steiners in Dornoff for a few years in the teens of the 20th century. He tried several times to draw a picture of Rudolf Steiner. He gave us a picture of someone bringing a tremendous gift who never found a way to set the gift down. Parts of it were taken, but the gift as a whole was not received. And so when he went away, he had to take it with him. Here at the end of the hundred year celebrations of Steiner's work, when the future spiritual development of that work is in question, according to Steiner's sense of the progress of centuries. Um, I think it's the moment for us to try to take this up. He stated this mission negatively. He said if anthroposophy hadn't become generally known by the end of the 20th century, we would be at the grave of civilization and the war of all against all. Extreme egotism and a lack of essentially the, the deep qualities of truth, beauty, and goodness, which are kind of the ideals of culture and civilization, the ideals of thinking and feeling and willing. So we've got this very <clears throat> big thing. And I, of course, being a communications person, uh, think it's all about communications. And of course, other people might have some other perspectives on it. There's a famous thing, the shoemaker thinks it's all about better shoes. I think it's about better communications. But there's a lot that we can be working on. And importantly, if we work in the right way so that we understand we've got a small group of people who know about anthroposophy, are engaged with it, perhaps even members of the School for Spiritual Science. That's a group of people who are pretty well accustomed to Steiner's language, even in English translation, which is always a bit imperfect. But there are also millions of people outside. As Steiner said himself very clearly, millions of people who will be looking for this, <clears throat> and uh, the time has passed, the people are looking for it. And we don't have to have just an inside of the anthroposophical society or the anthroposophical movement. We can recognize an outside. It's a little bit of group egotism if we focus only on who we are. But to go to people outside, we're going to have to work on language. We're going to have to understand how they think about things, how they talk about things, what anthroposophy or what Rudolf Steiner's cultural initiative may offer to them. And a lot of it's been worked with further by wonderful committed people for decades now, how it can transform their lives, how it can help redeem a world in which we do have a dreadful civilization full of vampires and werewolves and serial killers and violence and addictive sensuality and um, unrepentant greed and exploitation and a mirror opposite. We have what Steiner warned about, but we also have the inspiration of our truer humanness and the inspiration of the spirit of the times, the archangel Mikael as Steiner clued us in to where the higher consciousness behind this movement comes from. So we've got both sides and uh, a lot of human beings are really stressing the future. And a lot of young people are saying, where are we going that's worth going to? 
And when they meet the Anthroposophical Society, they're saying, you know, is there anybody here who doesn't have gray hair besides me? And uh, yeah, so that's a little bit on the situation. I'm going to touch on three things here, and then maybe we can open it up faster than last night to questions, comments, observations, suggestions. Uh, the discipline of communications has at its more rigorous center something called the semiotic model. Semiotics is the study of signs, S signs, gestures, meaningful, meaningful elements of communication. And the semiotic model typically has two goalposts and four elements in between, the way I learned it. And one goalpost is the sender. I'm the sender right now. I'm doing the talking, blah, blah, blah. It's all coming from me. If I'm not paying any attention to the full act of communication, uh, I may not be paying attention to the fact that somebody else is listening or trying to listen, trying to hear, trying to understand what I'm sharing. The receiver is usually thought of as the end of the communication, but you can also begin with the receiver. You can say, well, who are they? What are they looking for? How do they understand things? What language do they use? You can begin there and then you can say, well, what do I have to offer? And it may be nothing except, hello, how are you? But if you're not thinking about the receiver, your model for communications is deficient to begin with. We've got a challenge, and Rudolf Steiner spoke of it in 1923 in the weeks after the burning of the Gertianum, said that people come to anthroposophy out of a need of the heart, and they are looking for ideas, but you need to meet, meet them with an acknowledgement of who they are. You need to meet them from the heart. And if you just meet them with ideas, you're, you're losing one side of the communication. And they feel that. And it's a big reason he said already in 1923 why people do not come into relationship with the Anthroposophical Society. Because they come to it, they meet it, and they are not asked, well, who are you? It's like the Parsifal question. What ails thee? People come looking for this higher understanding because they realize that the world is in trouble. They personally may be in trouble. They are wounded. They need something. And do we ask what they need? Or do we simply say, well, here's, you know, here's knowledge of higher worlds. We're having a study group. That's okay, but it's pretty weak as communications go. Just person-to-person -person conversation would really be more anthroposophical, according to Rudolf Steiner. So people come and they do find out these things, but the inner part of the semiotic model is that there is the message, which is like a text in a book, or it could be the elements of a painting. That's the message in a painting. But then there is also the context, is this book gifted to you? Is this book on your phone? Is this book borrowed from the library? Um, is this an old, old book that seems rare and valuable? Is this badly printed and falling apart? There's certain context there. Is this a book that people are burning in some other country of the world or maybe in your own country? There are contexts like that. There can also be a subtext. A message, a communications can have a subtext. The subtext of 
a lot of good communications, well-intentioned communications gathered under the banner of capitalism or socialism is in capitalism. I can get a lot for myself and under socialism is we can get more for our class, the working class. There's a subtext that this isn't for everyone. The true subtext of anthroposophy is this is for everyone. This is for all humanity. Rudolf Steiner made very clear, you know, uh, the, using the word magic, white magic has to be for the universal good. So you can have subtext. We have an excellent subtext. I think that's key to why so many of us are so deeply committed to anthroposophy. We recognize it as having a deeply serious and positive purpose for everyone. It's not for some and against others. And then there's something called code, which is a little more complicated about the middle part of a communication. <clears throat> it's like, well, on these subjects, we talk about them in this way, or we prepare a communication physically in this form. <clears throat> You can take this model. For me, the most important thing, though, is simply sender and receiver. And we've been leaving out, to my mind, we've been leaving out the receiver. Uh, as someone doing communications for the Anthroposophical Society, the thing I'm happiest about was that we ended up calling our publication, which had been news for members. We decided to upgrade it and make it an outreach publication as well. So it had to have a different name than Moves for Members and became Being Human. It could have been Anthroposophy in America. That would have been fine. But Being Human is an open phrase. It's uh, every human being can see that and not feel automatically that it's not for them. The word anthroposophy is a little intellectual. You may even think that it's a misspelling of anthropology. It's, uh, it's a little bit of a communications obstacle at the beginning. We don't need that. We don't need obstacles. Uh, our true intentions and our true values can be expressed in many ways, and we don't need to hold on to things that that back in the days when Christian science was popular, when the uh, science of mind was created, when there was this strong feeling that uh, spiritual things would become a science. Uh, back then, anthroposophy was a good word. Spiritual science was a good phrase. Today, those don't have the same appeal. So... Uh, <clears throat> We need to work on language. And there's a good example. I'd encourage anyone who, uh, who has a little time to uh, get a copy of Buckminster Fuller's Operating Manual for Spaceship Earth. Now, Buckminster Fuller, I like to make these little connections. His, uh, his great aunt was a woman named Margaret Fuller Osoli, or Margaret Fuller. She went to Europe in the last years of her life, married a revolutionary in Italy, came back with her husband and baby and their ship sank off Long Island. And she had been editor with Ralph Waldo Emerson of the magazine, The Dial. And she's often considered the first uh, <clears throat> really intellectual exponent of feminism in America and the United States. And I've seen her said to be the leading expert on Goethe in her time in the 1830s and 40s. So Bucky Fuller was proudly her grandnephew. Um, he was in a family business as a young man. He had a wife and uh, I think just one daughter at that time. And he got to the point, he was here in Chicago where he felt his life was 
not going anywhere and maybe worthless and the business had failed and whatever. And he was walking along Lake Michigan somewhere. I don't know where you walk along Lake Michigan in the Chicago area and contemplate suicide, but that's what he was doing. And he decided, no, I'm going to dedicate my life to the well-being of all humanity. Everything I do from now on is going to be for all humanity. And so he became known, he became known particularly for the geodesic dome, which he didn't invent, but he popularized as a very significant structure. He came up with a every person's car, the Dymaxian car, a house that never got built that might have helped with the homelessness problem, Dymaxian house. He became a systems thinker. And just about the time that we had our moon expedition and finally had photographs of the earth standing out there, this big blue orb uh, in space, I think it was just before that that he came out with this operating manual for spaceship Earth, wherein he said the Earth is a spaceship and we are the crew. And you know what? There's no operating manual or none we're aware of. Well, Bucky speaking here, I'm very appreciative of our uh, clever responses to problems and crises that come up, <clears throat> like getting the top of a piano when uh, you're on board a ship that sinks, if the ship has a piano aboard and you can get the top loose, but, you know, ingenuity in response to crises, but we could plan. Planning would be, why don't we plan our future? Wouldn't, wouldn't a sensible crew, you know, be doing that. And you know, we should think as comprehensively as we are capable of doing. Human beings have become extremely good at specialization. I can't even think of an example, but you know, genomic biochemistry, um, cultural anthropology, you, you know, you get you're going out into the into the far twigs of specialization and you in your twig are dealing with something that nobody else understands exactly and you don't understand their work and nobody has a big picture of it. So I said, we need to you know, start working on general thinking. We need also to appreciate that this scarcity business that, that controls us through our economics is a falsehood that we have it because in the early 19th century, an uh, Englishman named Malthus came up with the idea of, uh, of our population outgrowing our food supply so that we would be faced with endless famines going into the future because of population growth. And he said, well, you know, from the data he used, that was plausible, but he didn't consider the idea of, of ingenuity. The way I would put it uh, is that humans have a partnership with ideas, which from an anthroposophical point of view would be beings. And so we've got a big partnership and these are very powerful beings, even if you can't measure them or uh, perceive them in the ordinary ways. And we've been able to do all kinds of things We've got many times the population of the planet that was there in Malthus time. And by Fuller's calculations in the late 1960s, he said every human being could live like as a king or queen is accustomed to if we were willing to do that. So this idea of scarcity, which is pushing us this way or that way, he said we should, we should have unlimited unemployment payments because if one person by his calculations, one person in 17 does what might be done with that time, creatively, productively, it'll take care of the cost. So we got this idea of scarcity, we've got this idea of laziness that people would like to do nothing. He said, no, this isn't true. He also said, we need to think about whole systems. 
we need to realize that the parts don't tell you what is going to happen in the whole thing. He brought the word synergy to a new level of popularity. Fuller didn't talk about anything like spirituality, and he wasn't writing an operating manual for Spaceship Earth. He was simply giving a context and some basic guidance as to how to go about it. And the other element he suggested was collaboration. He said, why don't we just work together? We're comprehensive. If we think of whole systems, if we don't fall for wrong ideas like scarcity and laziness, uh, and we work together, what could we not accomplish? So speaking into the American culture of his day and the great accomplishment immediately thereafter of putting human beings on the moon, however briefly, um, that is a very powerful communication and it resonated for decades. I didn't find it until after his death in the 1980s, but uh, it gave me a sense of what might be done to help human beings see what a future we have. Today, we have another picture, technological, that we are perhaps living inside a cosmic video game. It's not how they put it. They call it the simulation. They say, since we are able to create video games, since we are able to create what Facebook is trying to become, the metaverse, trying to create new levels of uh, illusion or maya beyond the divine one that is given to us as nature, as the cosmos, um, that there must be other higher beings somewhere who have higher technology and have already created these things. And we very likely are living inside a reality created by beings of higher intelligence with higher technology. If you're a little flexible in your thinking, you think, yeah, that's what the, the Bible says and most other religious and traditional myths, you know, higher consciousness beings created the world and we're living in it. <clears throat> Steiner gives us this picture, which uh, might be something to bring forward at this time, which is that, uh, and it's been picked up a bit in out of what I'd call the new age community or post new age, the idea that we are co-creators of the cosmos. Steiner is actually pretty explicit in relationship to beings of higher intelligence. We are the ones who are going to enter into a created world. Beings higher than ourselves would lose their character if they entered into this. We are going to enter into it, incarnate, in other words. We're going to become subject to the rules and laws of this world. We are initially going to have a connection that we're still conscious of with the creator or designer beings who stay outside the cosmos, but we're going to become completely enmeshed in this world, and we hopefully then will be able to wake up, realize what the situation is, and decide that we want to reconnect. And then, and that's the goal of initiation that in a certain way we die to our existence as physical beings incarnated in a material world and wake up to the fact that we are also part of the design team. Spiritual beings, non-material beings, beings of higher consciousness. This is a very up-to-date kind of perspective. Anthroposophy has all kinds of things to share. It's really phenomenal. So thinking of the technocratic world that is so potent in our time and the idea that artificial intelligence of machines is going to surpass us and control us. And as Elon Musk said a few years ago, we'll become like house cats inside this simulation created by mysterious advanced beings. Instead of that, we say, oh, no, we're actually connected with these 
angels, archangels, archai. We've got the names of them. We have a certain sense of what their powers are, what their intentions are. We also recognize that in consciousness, we're talking about beings. So they're beings who are testing and opposing us, making sure we're strong enough to take responsibility for this kind of higher uh, level of, of involvement in things. Yeah, <clears throat> Anthroposophy has this already. So we can, uh, we can speak in a very up-to-date way if we decide to do it, and we'd have to work together to develop these perspectives. That's another thing we can do. Um, and one more thing is that we talked about this a bit this morning. Steiner gives us this, to me, quite amazing picture that back 3,000 years ago and more, the human beings had, we, ourselves, still had connections with the higher beings, spiritual beings, if you like. We had capacities to be aware of these creative, or I like to call them design forces in the world, in the reality we're living in, the cosmos. And so people with more ability in that area entered the mystery temples where all of the different aspects of human culture and civilization were gathered in one place. And from that, in the outer work of the mystery temples, in the festivals, in the public activities, in the guidance of societies, um, everything was being take of, taken care of in very conscious ways. But those came apart because we were in process of, in human evolution, of becoming more and more detached from the higher beings, from the design team. And with that detachment, this specialization that Buckminster Fuller talks about that's so advanced today, um, begins and things separate as out as science or art or philosophy or religion. And there is, by our time, this powerful opposition between a natural science, which wants to be able to explain everything, and the remainders of traditional religions, which also have made a claim to explain everything, and they don't see each other as being completely valid. <clears throat> so we're divided between traditionalists or religious fundamentalists and uh, the more aggressive modernists who say, yeah, it's all scientific, it's all about physical evolution. We need to bring all of that back into relationship. And anthroposophy brings these pictures of the role of science in relation to thinking, of the arts in relation to feeling, and of our will in relation to morality, ethics. And it's a pathway to reconciling the different aspects of culture with each other. This again is a very, very big picture, but this is the part of the enormous gift that Rudolf Steiner brought, which until now we haven't entirely known what to do with. We've studied it. It's known in our study groups. It's discussed in, in many groups. It's available in translation in not one, but many languages. The question is, the situation of humanity today is such that maybe we need to start applying this as we've applied Steiner's initiative to education or to agriculture or to medicine or to eurythmy or speech or drama. 
big, 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 big pictures. But this is the scope of what Rudolf Steiner brought to us. Now, for us to act on it, it's not the job of Waldorf schools. It's not the job of biodynamic farms, even in winter when there may not be so much work out in the fields. It really has to be the work of the society and the school. But the society and the school don't have the resources to do very much with it. You know, I'm conscious of this stuff. I've been working on it since 1984. I, until recently, was director of communications for the American Society. But I was doing a whole bunch of things. And uh, the time to work on anything further just wasn't there. I was doing more than was typically done by one person, in an, even in a nonprofit. And there wasn't an obvious way um, billboards were brought up this morning. It was an obvious way to put up billboards with wonderful slogans, which would tell people, hey, check out your local branch of the uh, Rudolf Steiner Initiative Society. Um, it's got great things for your life, your personal life, your life in society, your social and cultural activism. We couldn't afford any of that stuff. But where we've arrived at with these new media based in the internet, based in this electronic interconnection of humanity, um, those things can be done very easily and very cheaply. And if you go looking at what's out there already, you see a lot of interest in questions that we've been considering ourselves. It's in different language, typically, but it's there. So to these big pictures of what anthroposophy could bring to humanity, there are very specific pathways which have opened up and which could be, you know, we need to educate ourselves about them. We need to develop our techniques. You know, all these folks who can just hold up their cell phone and do a 17 second video for TikTok about what they think of this or that or how well their work at the gym has been going or what amazing little animal friends they have. Um, people are putting themselves out there. We've got immense things to share and we're pretty remarkable individuals ourselves. I must say the thing I'm, the two, three things that I think we, our great resources are, are we've got these amazing ideas, far, far reaching ideas, the reach high, reach deep, reach out broadly. We've got people who are committed, sincere, striving people who've been working with these things a little time or a long time. And we've got initiatives which demonstrate what can be done. We have huge resources, we don't have money. The path to money is not such a difficult one. I guess I mentioned last night, we uh, in the United States spent something close to 17 billion, billion with a B dollars on the state and federal elections that we just held last month, $17 billion. And uh, the Anthroposophical Society of America has less than 1 million with an M dollars for an annual budget. A lot of that big money in the elections came from very wealthy individuals, and a lot of it came from people sending 15, 25, 35, 50, or five dollars, sending it once or sending it every month. We know from research there are lots of people interested in these questions of being human, like reincarnation. Might be a good starting place. We worked on that. 
It changes your life if you begin to think in terms of this life being something you're acting in this time, but that at another level, you're not the actor, you're also the author, and that you were part of a previous life, like a previous part of a play, and here's the next stage in the play, and here's the next stage. Simply to make that credible to people would change the quality of people's lives. People are eager for that kind of thing. People can share some resources. We could have many millions of dollars to work with every year if we made the decision to try to meet these people, understand their language, their concerns, and help them discover and help them show us and increase our scope. Um, how human life can be raised to higher levels. So I think this is practical. I think it's enormous. <laughs> I repeat that. I think it's enormous and I think it's practical. And the enormousness and the practicality come together in one place, which is the individual human being. Each human being can imagine things of cosmic scope and can also direct attention to things that are minute, particular, specific. Each human being can make differences in their own consciousness in their own way of being in their own life and in the lives of people around them really every hour of every day anthroposophy's greatest resource may be confidence in the human being and confidence in the human being is what we're missing today we have the idea we may be obsolete, we may be unnecessary, we may be a rogue species that is destroying the planet. Anthroposophy doesn't think so. It thinks we're in process. We're growing. We're capable of astonishing new growth. The so-called new frontier, which John Kennedy brought out as a slogan in 1960. Uh, the new frontier hasn't even been reached yet, or we're just at the edges. The new frontier is consciousness or spirit, if you prefer that word. So are we, as we taste these last centennial years of Rudolf Steiner's unbelievable activity, are we ready to make a new commitment to a new century of this work, which will reach farther and reach higher? That's a lot of talking. And I'm really appreciative of the people who've been here, both at the beautiful Rudolf Steiner branch in Chicago in person and online. And I think now, we're going to try to do a little dance. We're set up for this hybrid thing where there's a TV screen with the pictures you see on Zoom showing for the people here in the room in Chicago and getting it so the microphones and the speakers don't talk to each other in the wrong way. Maybe a little tricky, but I think we have it down. Andre Onegin is here making things work and uh, I'm going to hand it over to him to recognize people and I'll mute my audio while you okay dear friends can you can you hear me you can excellent thank you so, um, so we're moving into a uh, questions and answers section of our meeting. So you know what you have to do. So please navigate your 
course swords or arrows on the bottom of your screen and uh, select uh, emotions or oh, reactions, I'm sorry, reactions. And uh, from reactions, please select raise your hand, your electronic hand. Uh, yeah, and uh, if you have a question, please click on it. So you will see in chronological order who will be first, who will be second. So if any questions, your friends, Okay. All right. Ricardo was first. Ricardo, please unmute your machine. Yeah, go ahead. Um, yes, uh, John, thank you for that incredible vision. And um, it makes me feel how inadequate I am. And I'm supposed other people feel that way too. And then how we're going to do it. Uh, <clears throat> and of course, in the details, I think people would have different visions about how to go about it. Um, you mentioned two things, and I want to make sure I'm fair to you, but I, I find it difficult to bring the mes message of anthroposophy or cultural renewal through billboards or TikTok. And uh, I'm not su su suggesting that you were saying that, but you know, it just seems how you know how you can put something. And you can say something about confidence in the human individual, confidence in humanity, but that doesn't say that much about what anthroposophy is, you know? So it's just, I don't know how you could do that in a billboard or TikTok or, you know, someone would have to be really good to craft it right without trying to be a salesman. And, and just the, because we're inundated with all sorts of advertisement and all different types of uh, people, not necessarily selling products, but selling ideas and selling services <laughs> by that. And so I, I fear we might be that way if we're not careful. Okay. okay. I'm unmuting and we're doing a little dance so that we don't get echoes. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Ricardo. That's a very, very key question. I think Rudolf Steiner saying we need to, in a way, become one with the world means that we need to recognize it's another of the these huge things he brought. He actually, you know, many of the things he brought were already there. He brought them in this new way, this new context. But in Plato, it's said that the leadership of humanity it's originally with the priests, and then it's with the kings. You might include aristocrats with that in the later stages, and then it's with the merchants. Ultimately, it's going to be with everybody, with the ordinary people, all of us. But the leadership of the world right now is clearly with the merchants, isn't it? And so when you say that you're afraid we might be seen as selling something, I understand what you mean. And I think we have to get over that. Selling is a bad thing when you take advantage of people, when you give them something that is not of the value you say and take from them something which would be appropriate if it were of that value. First of all, we'd be operating on a voluntary basis. You contribute what you feel you can contribute and what you think it's worth. And uh, I think, you know, if we are offering courses and things, money back guarantees after the first quarter of the time would be very appropriate. Thinking sales, though, is, is difficult for us because I think most of us, most of us in the society come from a monastic background. And monastic was also academic a thousand years ago, reincarnations being typically a thousand years apart. Well, we didn't sell things in those days. You know, you, know, you don't sell things. Well, that's not where we're at. 
we're in 21st century America. This is the strongest economy on the world. Um, this is a planet run on capitalistic free trade economic principles above all with a nod to democracy. Um, let's not be afraid of proselytizing, which means communicating, selling, which means giving value for value, or giving value and receiving back free gifts. Rudolf Steiner, by the way, generally insisted on being paid for his talks, even if he immediately gave it back. Let's not let the conditions of these times and their conflict with our own possible karmic or contemporary ethical concerns block the way for us. Let's be sure we do it honorably, but let's not let that be the barrier to something much larger. And the confidence in the human being, I think for me is, is demonstrated in, in what I feel from my fellow anthroposophists. I have enormous confidence in what another anthroposophist would try to do for me if I needed help. I have that confidence extending beyond to most human beings. If I slipped and fell down on the sidewalk, a lot in Chicago, anybody nearby is likely to look and somebody's likely to come say, can I help you? And there's 911 if that doesn't happen. Um, Anthroposophists, I think a lot of people have developed this further. We can get better, but right now we're still conflicted by fear. We're conflicted by doubts. And we have hostility in the struggle to become individuals. So there are things working in an antisocial way against us, but they're part of the path to where we're going to get to. And it's the confidence in where we're going to get to that I would keep in mind. Thank you very much. Um, so Barry, yeah, please unmute your machine. There. Yeah, I have two points. Um, one is, um, I've noticed a campaign, and I understand this campaign was started by some um, Christians, um, in a sense, um, in response to the political evangelical movement. And some of you may have seen, if you watch football anyway, um, some ads where they say, Jesus gets us. And I found the ads very effective. Um, I forget exactly how they go. Um, phrases like Jesus suffered. Um, you know, Jesus gets us. It was kind of what they say. A very interesting campaign. So it's something maybe to look into. Um, but otherwise, I just wanted to ask I've seen that the Goetheanum is doing much more in terms of communication and outreach and how you feel about that. Have you recognized that? And are they um, moving in a direction that you would uh, like to see? Thank you, Barry. That's, uh, I haven't, uh been catching any football games, so I haven't seen that ad campaign, but I'll, I'll look for it. Um, and TV ads are very expensive. I don't expect us to be able to do that if we wanted to anytime soon, but uh, little ads on the internet or simple little presentations on TikTok or Instagram are very possible. We'd have to commit to learning how to do it. You need to develop some skill. You need to do it well. I think we could even develop some artistic possibilities that are new because we've got new media to work with. As far as the uh, Gertianum communications, I think that's terrific. 
Um, there's an awareness. There's there's a new involvement in the last several years that John Bloom has reported on on the involvement of country representatives, kind of the newer name for general secretaries, um, because not all countries have general secretaries or societies big enough to have one, but country representatives in the actual and an advisory way in the governance of the Gertianum. Also, it's not just the four people who are the members of the executive committee, the Vorstand, but it's all of the section leaders who are to collectively the Gertianum leadership. And after a number of years of English weeks every year or every few years that, Elizabeth, that uh, Virginia Cease usually organized and were wonderful, but few and far between, there's the awareness that if you don't speak German, your primary language may not be English, but it may be your secondary language. So that if there's going to be a second language, it's likely to be English. And then they are also doing a lot in Spanish, um, I think in French, but I've seen, you know, there's a lot of English language communications coming out. My thought about that is that it's very well done and it unavoidably has the flavor of the culture um, of the Gertianum, which while global in intent is quite specifically located in Switzerland. And I think from 1939 to 1945, we were all very happy, or we can be very happy that the Gertianum was in Switzerland, but Switzerland has a very specially developed international culture. There's also the, the Central European culture at large. There are the differences in cultural qualities between Europe between parts of Europe and between Europe and the United States. And over the decades, the Gertianum leadership has suggested to us here in the United States, they'd like to see us show some new things. And we haven't been able to do anything that was really a breakthrough. So I think the, the way of viewing things is significantly different there and that for our possibilities we need to develop our own capacities i think it also we tried to do this actually at the new york branch in the 1990s we tried to set up something called a threshold center which was a kind of foundation year and just when we were about ready to do it three of the four people leading it had to go do something else. Uh, interesting karma. And that was right before the year 2000. Um, but we had the feeling that, well, if you could make something happen in a big city like New York, Chicago, LA, you, you would have a national influence. And if you could make something happen in the United States, there's a certain way that people around the world look at the United States as a place of initiative and creativity and future orientation. And I think even though anthroposophy is pretty well known in much of Europe, a breakthrough culturally in the United States would have a real meaning in Europe. Whereas things that come from Europe don't have a similar impact in the United States honestly. Maybe we should be more open, maybe we should be more receptive, but uh, we spent a long time getting culturally independent of Europe, and I don't think Americans really expect to have the great new ideas coming from anywhere in Europe at this point. A little self-centered, but I think that's the situation. Uh, dear friends, any questions from our live audience? No? Okay, so Yaya. Uh -huh. Hello again. Mm -hmm. um, let me turn the volume up again. 
um, I just wanted to perhaps point out the fact that in some ways we are all merchants. We meet people on an everyday basis that do not belong to the society. When we go and do our shopping, when we meet the postman, in every walk of life where we work. And those are the possibilities that we have to communicate a message, even if we do not absolutely need to call it anthroposophy and scare people off. But we do have constantly on an everyday basis, the opportunity of communicating something meaningful for the whole of humanity. When you mentioned the fact, John, that one of the major resources that we have globally, it's our own self in a way, we are not using this potential to the full extent that we might. And if we perhaps take advantage of all the opportunities or even a percentage of the opportunities that present themselves to us, we can have a broader and deeper impact that we can perhaps hide in behind some sort of false modesty expect from ourselves. Thank you, Yaya. That's very well said. And I know over the years, it's it's not quite what I'm pointing to, but over the years, people have said, you know, the, the most convincing thing ultimately is who we are. I mean, the ideal thing, the highest point of communication is when you meet someone else and you think, what a wonderful person. And you wonder what may be contributing to their life. So, uh, you know, yes, as there's the broad kind of outreach we can make in various ways, and then it gets more and more personal and it comes down to face to face. And uh, yeah, thank you. Waldemar, are you ready? Waldemar. Yes, yes. Okay. thank okay. you very much. Uh, thank you for the inspiring lecture, John. I'll begin my question with a story. Last June, an article appeared in a semi-academic journal here in Sao Paulo, Brazil, calling Steiner a racist? Well, that's a, an old question, but he also called Steiner a genocide. So my question is the following. What should we do? I propose to the, to the board of our society, Brazilian you know, Anthroposophic Society in Brazil, that they form a group of academics to write down an answer, you know, showing how absurd that uh, statement was. Nothing was done. I myself started to write down an article trying to rebuke what this guy has uh, written. In Europe, this is happening every day, every week at least. You know, there are lots of uh, attacks against anthroposophy, world of education and so on, medicine and so on. So my question is, what should we do? I, my idea is that the society, you know, every country should protect the image one has of Rudolf Steiner and of anthroposophy. We should not leave, you know, these attacks without answer. You know, because they spread out. Nowadays, it's very easy to, you know, that this happens, right? I think one should do that. 
Uh, I would like to know what is your opinion in face of these attacks. Thank you. That's a, a very important question, Valdemar, and I'm glad that you raise it. I've, you know, tried to write some things in that direction. I've got something I kind of think of as being what I personally would want to say. And it's a little complicated because the first thing I would want to say to people who'd say Rudolf Steiner is a racist is and the white supremacist, you know, we can take on as a <clears throat> additional little tail on that uh, question. But is that the definition of racist being used by many well-intentioned people today, well-intentioned and purposeful people, is that anybody who believes that race may have some reality except as a social construct, a labeling done traditionally for purposes of putting some people above other people. Their view is that anybody who believes that there is some such thing as race is a racist. If you accept that viewpoint, Rudolf Steiner is a racist. He clearly believed there was reality to race. He also explicitly said this is something in progress of being um, going out of operation. But if you simply say, oh, he was good about this and he was good about that, you don't recognize where a lot of this is coming from. Um, then you don't answer their question, you don't satisfy them. You say, yes, he believed that there was such a thing as race. And if that is your basis for saying someone is a racist, he was a racist in that sense. Then I think we need to keep pulling up good statements. There's one from uh, Dan McCann, um, who is at the Harvard Divinity School who's spent a lot of time over a couple of decades with the Camp Hill movement in particular and written a book about anthroposophy and the environmental movement. And he has a paragraph in it in which he says a similar thing. <clears throat> he says that Rudolf Steiner made clear what his ideals were around this. And in according to those, he has no prejudice against any person on any basis like race uh, because he does recognize race as a reality in his field of work and research, you should perhaps call him a racialist. But it would that would be better than to call somebody a racist simply because they believe race is real. But we need to put some more things together. And then you go to the question of, well, what were Rudolf Steiner's positive beliefs? And then you can mention that some things came about in particularly his conversations with the working people, the construction workers at the Gertianum um, after World War I. And he gave these talks because they asked for them. They were frequently off the cuff. And he says some things which have peculiar uh, references to race, Africans particularly, which seem, you know, out of nowhere today. And you need to do your homework and realize that after the Great War, World War I, which in the West was fought largely on the soil of France, Germany invaded France through Belgium, and uh, the war was then fought in Northern France all the way to the armistice. It wasn't fought in Germany on the Western Front. And so when the Germans realized they could not win and it was time to have an armistice, the French occupied the industrial part of South Germany. And among the French troops were troops from French West Africa, Senegal, that part of the world. And this was an interesting thing for a European country to do. When Steiner says there's no need for Africans in Europe, 
he is not talking of generality. He's talking about French hosting their colonial African troops in German towns. So you need some historical dimension. And, and there's a question. The French were making a statement to the Germans. You lost. You caused us an enormous amount of suffering. And uh, here's, here's a thumb in your eye. Because wherever troops are posted occupying troops, there are also uh, children resulting out of the normal community processes and uh, so forth and so on. Uh, American troops who are African American in Korea are the parents of, of kids in Korea who've had a difficult life. So you got to get the fuller picture. The new definition of racist, according to, so, well, they call themselves often social justice warriors. They are fighting against the entrenched use of race as a divisive. Um, factor, particularly in, in the United States. And they have a lot of justification for doing that. Then there are the statements of Rudolf Steiner about his intentions and purposes. And then there, which show his universal respect for humanity and corresponding actions. And then you have particular situations that come up as unexpected remarks in certain conversations with people who, you know, these were outside, uh, the work of the Gertianum was outside Basel, which is where France, Germany, and Switzerland come together on the Rhine. And it was just a few hundred miles away that uh, the French West African troops were being posted. You might also add a bit of a disclaimer that Rudolf Steiner can't be responsible for everyone who, who appreciates his work and carries his work out. And many of us anthroposophists have taken things and generalized them and overstated them. And that's cropped up in certain situations. And that's not Rudolf Steiner, that's us. So that may be a four-part picture I would give you don't want it to be too long. We've got long, long papers about this. We've got good papers. But I think it's really important to get the history, to get the acknowledgement of the purpose. There are some people who are calling Rudolf Steiner racist for other reasons, but um, which are not reasons I can respect. But there are people who say anyone is a racist who thinks race is a reality and not simply a social construct used to dominate some people. So you say, okay, from that point of view, that's your point of view. I understand why you say that. There's also Steiner's statements, there's history, and there's what we individual Steiner followers may have done in the world. That should be a fair picture. Um, it won't stop people doing this, but it could be two pages long. And uh, people who are looking for fair mindedness usually want, it's, it's really desirable to acknowledge the people that you are talking back to. Uh, it's in the history of the individuality we know as Rudolf Steiner, it's a work of. Uh, of Thomas Aquinas, it's in the work of Aristotle, that they often describe the ideas they disagreed with very thoroughly and carefully first, maybe stating them better than the people who had originally asserted those views, stating those views clearly and well before saying why they disagreed with them. So if we can embrace why people might say Rudolf Steiner is a racist for good reasons, um, if we don't agree with them, we stay it well first. I think that's in the right spirit of truth seeking. And I hope that's helpful. It's a difficult matter. Um, yeah, thank you very much, uh, Charlene. Um, well, I had a question, John. Thank you so much. Have you written a book or are you 
thinking about writing a book on communicating anthroposophy or um, because you're, you're right. And for Americans, maybe in particular, I know Peter Selg has written a lot of books and um, and others, but I don't know of a good book to recommend to my friends. When I mentioned something about the threefold social order, um, anthroposophy, Rudolf Steiner, um, spiritual science, um, yeah, I don't really get very far, I feel like. They go, they're open, but they, you know, and, and the ones that check it out, oh, you know, it, it they find some benefit, but they look at Steiner as, you know, being, yeah, not current in Europe. And yeah. And then the other question in the chat, I, I don't know if I can ask Jeannie um, Doty. Um, yeah, I, I what her disappointment was with your answer. Because, um, yeah, about because that was a good question. Is Steiner a racist? And I thought a lot about it, too. And I appreciated your answer. So so about your book, or do you have a book? And then that whole question about, yeah, that you just answered pretty completely, I thought. Thank you. Thank you, Charlene. I, yeah, the idea I had in 1983 was write a book, be done by the year 2000, and it would explain why we, why we can be hopeful about the future of humanity, which was uh, already an issue then, particularly out of the ecological movement that we're the rogue species destroying the planet and Earth would be better off without us. Um, I finally got a version of that done in 2017, and I'm updating it a bit. And I think the difference, there are lots of great books being written. Peter Selg is some kind of a miracle. I mean, he's doing a bunch of stuff. He's got a practice as a, <clears throat> as a doctor. I think he has six kids. Um, and he's turned out these excellent books. So yeah, I, I guess he just doesn't sleep. But uh, the book I want to have written and updated really is facing out from the anthroposophical society and isn't based in our language or our references. And it brings in Rudolf Steiner repeatedly for his expertise and his initiatives, but it doesn't present itself as a, you know, a Steiner initiative or a Steiner promotion book. And, you know, I'll see if I can get an updated version of that by uh, maybe this next summer. But thank you for, thank you for asking. And let's see. Yeah, they're excellent comments in the chat and I hope everyone will look at the chat we're not going to be able to get to everything there, but uh, if there was something you were not satisfied with in the question, I see, please update your response to this issue of race. Do as you say, listen to where people are and meet them there. Well, that's what I'm hoping to do on the race question because you know, I've not been exactly detached from the African-American community, particularly in my work in New York. Uh, I was very, I think, significantly engaged in that as I could be. And again, I may not have a perfect sense of why people are saying, if you believe race is a real thing, you are a racist. Um, but I've heard that explicitly from experts, you know, PhDs, public intellectuals, African Americans on, on television, on the internet. So that's at least one part of it. If there are other parts, feel free to, uh, to educate me. I'd appreciate it.
Thank you very much. Um, so any questions from audience? Uh, Walgamoth, can we just um, give a... Okay. Uh, a uh, possibility to ask a, one second, uh, Waldemar. We have, yes. uh, yeah, yeah, just, just wait for a second. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. I mean, it's Leon. Hi, everyone. Um, I've been a member of many organizations, and I'd like to make a, cu a couple of three suggestions. One is academics. Now, uh, in academics, one argues with the intellect particularly. And the example I'd like to give of that is currently um, Jordan Peterson online, where um, he has, through just a few years, amassed an enormous audience, both uh, in public and world tours and online all the time. And he has had arguments with people who have accused him of transphobia and other nonsense, who are maybe um, journalists with an ax to grind or a desire to create false con conflict where there isn't any conflict. And he's argued with his intellect to demolish their notions and convert people to his thinking very clearly. Um, my second example is the Ed Casey organization. <clears throat> and they have done several things that I found very interesting. Like Casey's son took over the organization and decided on spreading the word. And in those days, the way to do it, he picked was through little paperbacks that could be placed in airports mm -hmm. that summarized and compiled the information that he gave, very effective. And he started conferences where someone who was currently of interest, like someone who'd gone through say a, um, a near death experience and had written a book on it, would be the featured speaker. And they would introduce lots of people in the audience to a conference through that leading figure who would then find out about Casey. And that's how I came across anthroposophy. They invited an anthroposophist, a leading person in a movement, to talk about Waldorf over a, a week. It was extraordinary. It wasn't based on Edgar Casey. Um, and also, I, something else I mentioned about them that I've really appreciated, they had a study group department where you could co contact people who were very familiar with study group work for advice on starting one and going through different phases of its development and so forth. The other organization that I've been involved with where they've been uh, working for successfully for several decades and have developed a group of graduates that are now internationally over 3 million in number through no advertising right from the beginning, just word of mouth was the S training going into the landmark work. And this is all about being human too. And they talk about that very, very concretely. Um, and they were misunderstood right from the beginning and they're still misunderstood. And they dealt with that very much through their lawyers. And when they were accused of things like being a cult or brainwashing even, or different notions, they took people to court and they dealt with it very clearly and stopped it basically <laughs> extraordinarily effectively. So, you know, in those kind of contexts, it's very difficult to speak rationally with people who are there to attack you. And in the, in, in the case of the founder of that work, his reputation was attacked in particular, because I think if he'd been um, actually killed physically, his work might, might have been evaluated much more 
objectively, but instead it was far more effective to destroy his reputation and put him out of action in many ways. So they're my suggestions anyway. Um, John, are you going to respond? Yeah, I'd just like to uh, respond. Jenny added, in my opinion, race is a conversation about inclusion and privilege. John's answer brings no inclusion, and inclusion is the language we use today, and we need to recognize this. I was actually trying to be inclusive by saying the first thing in our response to a charge of racism about Rudolf Steiner would be to acknowledge that if you are using the word from this viewpoint, which is about inclusion and privilege, um, and the next step from there is to say, you know, <clears throat> there's a difference in opinion. Is race something real or is race simply made up? Is there no difference between the races? Um, Rudolf Steiner clearly believed there were differences, that they originated over 10,000 years ago in Atlantis, and that they were in the process of being, you know, of disappearing as human beings encounter each other, intermarry, become culturally global now. Um, but if you believe there is such a thing as race, uh, you are a racist. <clears throat> um, that's how I've heard the conversation put forward a number of times, and I wanted to include it by making that first and saying, yes, if that's your point of view, you're calling Rudolf Steiner a racist would be justified. And that's, you know, words change in their meaning. So I want to be clear about that. Inclusion is incredibly important. It's not some pigs are better than others. That's... Orwell's Animal House. Uh, dear friends, I feel uh, maybe we can move in different directions uh, because the uh, topic of our presentation is quite different than question of race. So we're talking about world communication. Can I ask about it? Uh, Waldemar. Uh, so, what's your question? Uh, well, I don't know <laughs> if I should proceed. Uh, no, I would like to insist on my question. Uh, for some reason, I cannot hear you. Well, uh, my microphone is working. Yeah, yeah, sorry, it's my mistake. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. <clears throat> my question is the following. What should we do when someone writes an article calling Steiner a genocide? This has happened here. My idea is that every anthroposophist should be a protector, you know, should defend Steiner in anthroposophy. One of the missions, I would like to hear you about that, one of the missions of the anthroposophical societies in every region is to protect Steiner and anthroposophy. So if someone attacks uh, Steiner and anthroposophy, there should be an answer. There are some people, you know, it happens here, that think, well, just don't, don't do anything about that. You know, the question will fade out. But I don't think we should uh, do that. And I would like to hear your opinion. What should we do? What should the society do? So maybe I can put it a little simplistically. I think we need to defend without being defensive. And I think the best defense of Rudolf Steiner is to work to put his whole vision out there and that the, this is not something that the society has really understood as its task so yes i would suggest being responsive being responsive respectfully 
being responsive inclusively, but not focusing on just defending, focusing on the mission that Rudolf Steiner was carrying, which as you've heard from me, I believe was not, not really taken up by the society, not understood to be our task or not even understood at all. He talks about civilization and culture repeatedly. He had some, you know, in addition to what I went over last night, there are many other references and speaking with very significant individuals who did great things, uh, like the founder of the Christian community. But the idea of advancing a new civilization or moving civilization as a whole in new directions um, was beyond us. I say beyond us, I feel like probably I was part of the problem. It shouldn't be beyond us now. It really can't be. If we want anthroposophy to continue to grow as a cultural, spiritual impulse in the world. And as people understand the larger intention of anthroposophy, you know, questions will be raised, racism, class privilege, Eurocentralism, uh, and so forth. They have their validity and their validity doesn't disqualify what Rudolf Steiner brought as far as I'm concerned. Embrace, acknowledge, and carry the vision forward and higher. People, people of all kinds have met Rudolf Steiner's vision and found it to be enormously valuable individually and socially. So I, I have confidence in that as well as in fellow human beings. Thank you very much. Uh, so, dear friends, we are working one hour and 45 minutes, and uh, if it's no questions, so I would like to conclude the session. And uh, I'd like to say thank you to John, who made here from Ann Arbor, and uh, he gave outstanding uh, weekend to us, two lectures, and uh, for almost four hours workshop. Yeah, dear John, thank you so much. Uh, and dear friends, thank you so much for joining us. And uh, uh, two lectures that were recorded and we're going to post on our website as soon as possible. So please feel free to unmute your machines and to greet John and say thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, John. Thank you, John. Thank you. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you, John, so much. You inspire me. Inspire me. <laughs> Thank you, John. Thank you, John. At the risk of an echo, thank you all for being here. Oh, I love the echo. Thank you. It's like from heaven, yeah? <laughs> yep. Yep. And thank you, Andre and John and everyone. Yes, yes. Thank you, Charlene. Thank, yeah, thank you. you. Okay, so I'll see you around. So we have uh, Christopher Bot next week uh, and looks like it's gonna be Zoom. I'm not sure because I still didn't talk to him, but Ooh. please stay tuned uh, because Tuesday, seven o'clock central time, it's very possible. So it's gonna be Zoom presentation of Christopher Bot. Wow. Uh, challenges of economic. Thank you so much, and uh, I'll see you online again. All right. Thank you.